right, so in this picture, as I already mentioned, what we're really looking at um, here is the baby crowning. Um, and I, the other part about this, uh, it, as you're looking in the progression of the diagram from figure A to figure D, you'll notice that the space between the vulva and the rectum decreases. So that's really um, trying to emphasize the pressure uh, that is placed on the rectum as the baby moves and descends through the birth canal. The woman is going to use her secondary powers um, or those bearing down efforts to help in the expulsion of the fetus. Studies have shown that labor, vaginal labor, is actually um, good and uh, not that it's good, but which it is, my side note but that pushing is actually more effective. When a woman has that bearing down um, reflex, so if she feels that Ferguson reflex that we talked about, um, and it ultimately le will lead to less pushing time, we have that, you feel that reflex, you have that release of the oxytocin, um, that natural pitocin, that love hormone, and we're able to expel that fetus with less time. This is really where the support person comes into play. Some women during the birthing process will be told to touch their baby's head as it comes at this point. Some women want to do that, some women don't, um, but that's completely up to them. So yep, so this is the crowning. Now if an episiotomy is going to be performed, this is the time when it's going to happen. So. Uh, during this stage, okay, so here we've got the distended perineum here on the left, and this is um, the various cuts on the right for an episiotomy. So uh, episiotomy uh, is provider specific. Um, each provider will have their own technique. Each provider will decide whether they want to allow the woman to tear on her own, um, or if they want to aid in the, in the process by, by way of the episiotomy. So in episiotomy, um, basically what's happening here is that the vulva, for whatever reason, is not allowing the passage of the head. The head, or we've already got the crowning here, right? Um, baby has already passed those ischial spines. The widest part of the baby has already been through the narrowest part of the birth canal, but yet we're still having a problem here. So the provider may choose um, to do this episiotomy where we're going to do the local anesthetic, usually it's xylocaine, so a lidocaine um, epinephrine mix, which really uh, localizes that um, medication to this specific area. Uh, and then we have a couple of different cuts. We have a midline and a medial lateral. So the midline episiotomy goes straight down from the vulva to the anus, okay? So obviously you can see the, the practitioner's hands um, being very careful to avoid, obviously, the head of the infant. Um, there is less pain with a midline um, episiotomy, less postpartum pain, but there's an increased incidence of a second and third degree tear. Because um, if we start it, you know, if we start like just a first degree, t you know, cut, first degree episiotomy, and then it naturally, as the baby comes out, um, rips into a third or a fourth degree tear, that obviously is less desirable. We don't want that to happen. A medial lateral episiotomy has an increased risk of blood loss. If we go off to the side, increased postpartum pain, um, but it might prevent that fourth degree tear. So during the laboring process, uh, the labor, the practitioner or the provider is going to have their hands on the infant, um, but they will also be using their hands. Uh, this is really trying to guide the delivery of the baby. We're trying to prevent trauma. Um, we're trying to control the birth uh, in some sort of way. So the Rickens maneuver is where the provider places the fingers inside the mother's rectum. Um, in this case, the fetal chin is reached for and then it's pulled for, pulled anteriorly. So through that thin vaginal rectal membrane, um, the provider is actually able to manipulate the, the fetus. At this whole time, though, they're keeping their fingers of their other hand on the fetal octopus in order to control that, again, that speed of the delivery 
and to keep flexion of the fetal neck. Another provider might choose to have more of a hands off or a hands poised position in which the, they're just putting light pressure upon the head to actually control that delivery, okay? Um, so after the head is born here, okay, we're gonna try, we're gonna pause um, during the delivering process. At this point, this is where the provider checks for a nuchal or the cord wrapped around the neck. If it is tight, if we already, if we have a nuchal cord, the provider's gonna go ahead and clamp the umbilical cord because at this point we don't need that umbilical cord. The head has already been delivered, okay? We've already trying to, you know, this baby is already transitioning um, to, you know, doing life on their own, life-sustaining measures on their own. Um, this is not a point to have a tight nuchal. This is not a point to actually choke the baby, okay? After we've done the nuchal cord check, you'll have the delivery of the shoulders and the body. The third stage is the placental separation and expulsion. Um, this is not a time that is typically remembered very, you know, well in detail because at this point, the provider is still down between the woman's legs, okay? The nurse, um, you've got a mom nurse who is probably um, assisting the provider and also assessing mom. And then the baby nurse is over at the isolate, and that's usually where the part, or the isolate, the, um, the radiant warmer. And the partner is over there usually looking at baby as well. Or baby is up on mom's chest, one of those two places. And the baby nurse is assessing baby on mom's chest. So, however, with that being said, they still control the delivery of the placenta and keep an eye on it. So the placenta should be expelled within 10 to 15 minutes after delivery. So during this time, the uterus is continuing to contract as mom is already beginning to bond with baby. Um, the first, the placenta is going to separate from the decidua. Okay, so at this point, it's still adhered to the wall of the uterus. And obviously after, and only after that, can it be expelled. So some signs of separation that the provider is going to be looking for. Um, a contracted fundus. We want that uterus nice and hard. It's going to actually be pushing, again, still that musculature, pushing that placenta out. We have a gush of vaginal blood as the placenta separates from the decidua, and we have all of those um, fingerlings of the placenta that actually come apart from the wall of the uterus. Remember how big the placenta is. It's a dinner plate-sized gaping hole right inside the, the uterus so a vaginal a gush of vaginal blood is to be expected the umbilical cord is going to lengthen obviously as that placenta comes out you have less you have more real estate than of the cord that transitions with it so the placental cord lengthens and the uterus changes shape to more of a globular shape now because we don't have that placenta reinforcing the sides of it there are going to be two sides of the placenta, which we'll look at here momentarily.